Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on providing accessible services for students who are blind or visually impaired or deaf slash hard of hearing. Um, before I present our presenter today, Paige Furbush, I just want to go over a few quick key reminders that to please remember to mute your sound throughout the whole presentation. We will be having a question and answer session towards the end, about 10, 15 minutes at the end. So if you have a question you would like answered towards the end, please feel free to drop that in the chat function. And if you are comfortable, please feel free to turn on your video. Your presenter today is Paige Furbush. Paige is a teacher of the deaf, blind, and LSLS certified auditory verbal therapist. <clears throat> she received her master's in education from the University of Utah in 2018 and is currently pursuing her BCBA. For the, for the last three years, Paige has worked for Utah schools for the deaf and blind serving preschool, elementary, and high school age students with dual sensory loss. Before that, she worked in a large school district as an early childhood special educator and served students with a variety of de de developmental disabilities. We are so excited to have you here today, Paige. Thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much um, for the introduction. I'm super excited to be here today. I know we are um, kind of limited on time. I think each of these topics uh, individually could take like at least an hour a piece. So I'm just going to try to get through our material as quickly as I can, but also as thoroughly as I can. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about how to provide accessible services for students who are blind, visually impaired, or deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to touch on is just some basic terminology for this topic. So when you see BVI, that stands for blind or visually impaired. TVI is teacher of the visually impaired. Um, I know it sounds a lot like I'm saying TBI, but I'm not. Uh, TVI, I will not be talking about traumatic brain injury today. So if you hear that acronym, I'm referring to teachers of the visually impaired. Um, O&M stands for orientation and mobility, which is um, a subject that's taught to students who are blind or visually impaired that teaches them how to safely travel. So if you've ever um, had experience with a blind or low vision individual and they use a white cane, that's what an O&M specialist would be um, doing with that child is teaching them those cane travel skills. CI is cochlear implant, HA hearing aid, DHH, uh, deaf hard of hearing, you might also see in literature other resources about deaf, hard of hearing individuals, lowercase d slash capital D deaf. And we'll get into that a tiny bit in a minute. Um, that's just referring to a deaf individual who identifies as part of deaf culture. So that would be a capital D deaf or a deaf individual who uses hearing technology and identifies more with hearing culture. So that's when you would see a lowercase d. Um, TOD is teacher of the deaf, ASL is American Sign Language, and then LSL stands for listening and spoken language. I don't think that's as widely known among professionals outside of the world of hearing loss and deaf ed. So listening and spoken language is the instructional approach that we use for deaf hard of hearing students who are learning to use their hearing technology. So hearing aids or cochlear implants. So when you see LSL, that's what that refers to. And then really quick before we start, I just want to point out that we do not use the phrase hearing impaired. Um, we always say hard of hearing. And it's kind of confusing because in a lot of like the educational law, you'll still see hearing impaired used. used. You'll still see that in a lot of the research as well. Um, but just be aware of the fact that individuals in the deaf community do consider the term hearing impaired as a slur. So it can be very offensive to them. Um, so just kind of practice using hard of hearing instead of hearing impaired. There are some adults who are deaf that do self-identify as hearing impaired. So you may hear them use that phrase and that's totally fine. Um, just to play it safe, 
try to not identify someone as hearing impaired yourself. And you can always check with them and ask what they prefer and how they identify. Okay, so really quick, we'll just go over some basics. So sensory impairments, which include hearing loss, vision loss, and deaf blindness, which is that combined sensory loss, are all considered to be very low incidence disabilities. So in Utah, children with a visual impairment only make up 0.5% of children with disabilities who receive services under Part C of IDEA, and only 0.3% of children receiving services under Part B. Children who are deaf, hard of hearing make up about 1.2% of children with disabilities um, receiving services under Part C and 0.9% of children receiving services under Part B. So it is very low incidence. I think that most of us probably don't have a ton of experience um, interacting with this either of these populations at all. Um, however, as IDEA has evolved over time, LRE now is widely accepted to mean the general education classroom and inclusion, even though it's not outlined specifically in the law in IDEA, really has become the goal for students with disabilities. So we are seeing more and more students with hearing loss and vision loss that are being educated in their neighborhood schools when historically children with sensory loss typically attended like residential schools for the blind or residential schools for the deaf. Um, that's becoming less and less common as we're seeing increases in technology and just kind of overall like our societal view on how these populations should be included in gen ed settings. So that means that any of us who are working in the schools are probably going to encounter some students with vision loss or hearing loss um, at some point in our careers. And we get to kind of an issue that's a little bit problematic in that a lot of our programs that prepare school professionals don't specifically cover how to work with either of these populations. So we have a lot of professionals who don't have that personal experience, don't have that educational experience. And so they're getting students that um, they might not feel comfortable serving or are unaware of kind of how to best accommodate for their needs. So I think I'm hoping today will be helpful for you all to kind of touch on that. So these are some interesting statistics that I think especially apply to you guys as school psychology students or school psychologists already working out in the districts. So it's estimated that about 40 to 50% of students who are deaf or hard of hearing have an additional disability. Um, and that includes like ASD, intellectual disability, ADHD, speech language impairment. So it's a really high number of the students who are deaf, hard of hearing that are also eligible for additional special education services. Um, it's estimated that 9% of children who are deaf, hard of hearing have ASD. So that's a pretty big difference from the prevalence that we see in the general population, which is about 1.8%. Um, and then an estimated 50% of students who are blind, visually impaired also have a concomitant learning disability. And 19% of children who are blind, visually impaired have ASD. So that's a huge difference. Um, from a sighted child and what we're seeing in the general population. There are a couple specific ocular disorders that are linked to higher prevalence of autism. So I'm not gonna get into that in too much detail today, but I thought it would be helpful to, for you guys to know what those are. So the first one is optic nerve hypoplasia um, or ONH. And that's actually the number one cause of blindness and visual impairment for the pediatric population today. Um, another one is retinopathy of prematurity or ROP. And then the third is anothalmia or microthalmia. And so that means anothalmia is when a child is born um, with no structure of the eye. So the eyes are completely absent. And then microthalmia is when a child is born with very small eyes that usually don't function very well. So in those populations, you're probably gonna see total blindness or light perception only. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about students who are deaf, hard of hearing, and we'll just go over like how to make sure your services and instruction is accessible to these populations. Some basic considerations for working with kids who are deaf, hard of hearing 
issues with assessment and then impact on social skills. So these pictures are just three different examples of really common hearing technology that you might see. So in the top right, this is a child using a cochlear implant. In the middle is a pretty basic behind the ear hearing aid. And then at the bottom, that's called a Baja or a bone anchored hearing aid. So we'll see those um, with children who have some type of like external malformation of the ear um, and can't use an in the ear hearing aid. So we use a Baja where that little like circular piece behind the ear just sits on that bone that's behind the ear and sound is actually conducted through that bone for all of us. So if the child has like a closed ear canal or a malformed outer or middle ear, um, a hearing aid can actually be placed on that bone and it provides additional amplification. And they usually wear it on a soft band that kind of goes around their head. So just thought it'd be nice to um, show you guys some examples of what you might see. So really quickly, we'll just touch on the difference between deafness and hearing loss. So again, capital D deaf versus lowercase d deaf is getting into that deaf culture piece. And this is a very, um, not necessarily complex issue. It's just very personal to the deaf community. Um, deaf culture truly is amazing. People who identify as part of deaf culture don't view their deafness as a disability. Um, they do not really identify with hearing culture at all and oftentimes aren't interested in participating in hearing culture. Um, they use ASL. Most of those students are going to be attending the school for the deaf where all students use ASL as their primary mode of communication. They're not typically as open to the use of hearing technology. Um, it can get really emotional for them. Um, most of you probably won't have a ton of experience with a like capital D deaf student in um, like a mainstream setting, a student that uses ASL because a school for the deaf is actually considered the least restrictive environment for them since they have full access to communication with other ASL users, which they don't have in a gen ed setting, even with the use of an interpreter. Um, and then lowercase d deaf, again, is gonna be that subset of the population who typically does use hearing technology and does identify as part of hearing culture and is mainstreamed in a gen ed setting. There's a huge diversity in the experiences of individuals with a hearing loss. It's very different from family to family, from child to child. So just be really sensitive of that if you are working with a child with hearing loss, getting to know kind of their family perspective, um, cultural perspectives of hearing loss in general will be really helpful for you to serve them effectively. Um, and again, we're going to see those students who use hearing aids or cochlear implants and spoken language in more inclusive settings. So that's going to be the population you'll probably have the most experience with in the schools. Um, so when a child is born with a hearing loss, the amount of auditory input is obviously reduced. So this means that the auditory pathway in the brain does not develop appropriately. And the development of the auditory pathway begins in utero. So long before the baby is actually born, um, all three components of the ear, so inner, middle, and outer ear, are actually developed very early on in pregnancy um, by week four to six those structures are already in place. So if there's no stimulation occurring in that auditory pathway, both in utero and then once the child's born, the development of speech and language is really difficult and we're probably gonna see some delays. We are pre-wired to learn spoken language by listening. So when we think about a hearing loss, we usually think about, oh, well, we hear with our ears. So once they have their hearing aids or once they have their cochlear implants, they can hear, but hearing happens in the brain. That's where we listen. So even with hearing aids on or cochlear implants in, they, the sound might be going through, but that auditory pathway, the development of that still has to catch up. So that listening piece tends to come later. And again, we're gonna see delays kind of across the board, especially in the area of speech and language um, with these kids. So just be mindful of that too. 
There are four degrees of hearing loss, so mild, moderate, severe, and profound. I do have a simulation um, of the different levels of hearing loss. I'm not sure if we're gonna get to it, so I'll save it for the end, and then hopefully we have time to do that when we wrap up. Um, but just be aware with a mild loss, the student still may miss 25 to 40% of speech. With moderate, that goes up to 50 to 80% of speech. Severe hearing loss, they're probably missing all speech sounds, but might respond to environmental sounds like a car driving by, a car honking, an airplane in the sky, um, a loud alarm clock, a fire alarm, things like that. And then a profound hearing loss, um, those individuals probably only hear vibrations without any amplification. So keep in mind that once a child has received appropriate hearing technology, whether it's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, um, the goal of an audiologist is always to get them corrected up to normal levels of hearing. Um, some students with more significant hearing loss may still be in that mild range. So it's really important that you look at their hearing, um, like audiology reports, look at those summaries, look at the audiogram in their file so that you know what the degree of their hearing loss is and make sure you're aware of what that is with amplification. So they might have a severe profound hearing loss without their hearing aids, but maybe their hearing aids correct them up to the mild range. So just keep that in mind and make sure you're aware of the differences between the two um, levels, both corrected and uncorrected. Okay, so we're going to start talking about just some basic considerations when you are working with a student who's deaf or hard of hearing. Um, really, it's all about access. That's what we're going to be focusing on the most today. Um, assistive technology like hearing aids or CIs are not really a substitute for normal hearing, and that goes back to they might be hearing all the sounds, but they don't know how to process what they're hearing or they have delays in their auditory comprehension. And even if they're showing like age appropriate comprehension skills like on um, tests that have been done or any communication assessments the SLP has done, that comprehension can still be significantly affected if there's background noise, um, if you're speaking to the child at a distance or when there's more than one person speaking at once. So our kids with hearing loss um, often struggle with just hearing and understanding sounds around them. They're gonna struggle with morphology, so that's hearing and producing speech sounds, learning new vocabulary, putting sentences together and using correct grammar or syntax, um, semantics, they struggle understanding more advanced components of language, such as figures of speech, plays on words, um, it might just not make sense to them. They might not have the language and vocabulary to effectively express themselves. Um, they struggle to follow directions sometimes. They might struggle paying attention or following along conversations with others. And so especially for those last four um, issues that we might see with kids with hearing loss, think about how this might manifest in a school setting. Um, these common symptoms of hearing loss often mimic symptoms of ADHD, of a learning disability. So there's a lot of debate in our field of whether or not kids with hearing loss are actually like overdiagnosed with additional disabilities. That's why it's so important to just make sure that you're really collaborating with the teacher of the deaf, you're collaborating with the families, and that you're really making an effort to understand what living with a hearing loss is like. So when we're thinking about access, our main goal is just increasing their access to sound and to what's going on around them. So the most important thing is just to make sure you're reducing background noise. If they're in your room, think about the equipment that's around. Um, is the fluorescent lighting like making a hum? Is, are they seated underneath like the HVAC system where they can hear that sound coming through? Is your computer on and sleeping and making a humming noise? Is there a projector on in the room that you're not using that you could turn off? These are all things that are gonna impact how clearly the sound comes through their hearing technology. Um, keep the curtains or shutters on your windows down or closed. This has to do with like sound reverberation. So we want to decrease like how much sound can reverberate in a room. Windows, the glass is a hard surface. So sound bounces off hard surfaces 
more than it bounces off soft surfaces. So that's a really simple thing you can do to decrease background noise. Um, see the student away from windows for the same reason. Keep the door to your room closed if you can. Um, there can be a lot of extraneous noise that comes through from kids and other people walking through the hall, making sound out there. So just be mindful of that. And then think about the flooring. I know we don't have a ton of control over this in our rooms, but if you do have access to a room that has carpet, it's much better than like tile um, floors that we usually see in schools more because they're easier to clean. But again, it's to help with the ver reverberation of the sound. And then another way to increase access is just decrease the distance between you and the student. So all hearing devices have a microphone on the outside. CIs and hearing aids both have those. Um, the microphone obviously is what brings sound in and then amplifies that for the child. So if you can just decrease the distance between you and the microphone, you're going to really up the chance that they're hearing you and that your speech is coming through clearly. Um, face the student when you're speaking. A lot of us also tend to like use hand gestures a lot and might put our hands up and around our face. That can also interfere with the quality of the speech signal. So just try to keep your hands down away from your face. Um, and again, keep your face directly towards the student. This is optimal for the transmission of um, speech from us to their ears or their technology. And then get to know their listening preferences. You might have a student who has a unilateral hearing loss meaning they only wear a hearing aid or a cochlear implant on one side. So if that's the case and their other ear has normal levels of hearing, um, be aware of that because you'll probably wanna position yourself to be closer to the side that has better hearing. Even students with bilateral hearing loss may have unequal levels of loss in each ear. So even if they're using hearing aids or cochlear implants on both sides, there might be one side that hears a little bit better. So just ask them, do you have a better ear? Is there a better side for me to speak on and just get to know them that way. Um, explain words with multiple meanings and idioms directly. This is a huge um, delay that we often see in kids with hearing loss is that they struggle with those words with multiple meanings. They struggle with idioms and figures of speech. So I try not to use like a lot of idioms or figures of speech with my students. Um, but if you are using them like in a group setting, just make the extra effort to define it a little more explicitly for the child with hearing loss. Um, you want to use multiple modes of representation. So if you can use visuals, if you can use manipulatives, pictures, videos um, to help kind of get your point across, that's super helpful for someone with hearing loss. Um, also, we might think that for someone who's hard of hearing, it's effective to speak louder. It's not. Um, when we speak at an artificially loud volume, our speech is actually distorted. So we're saying the same thing, but because it usually impacts like our intonation and prosody when we're like making an effort to talk really, really loud, that's gonna distort the speech signal. So it's really not helpful. It's actually worse than like if there's a lot of background noise or your speech is muffled. So just make an effort to speak more clearly. That has the biggest impact. And you can always ask too, if they don't understand you, did you understand me? Did you hear what I said? Or I like to say, like, what did you hear? So we're not singling them out or making them feel bad for misunderstanding, but just getting some like accountability for their listening skills and kind of hearing back in their own words, what did they hear us say? It can be helpful for us. Um, if they're really not understanding you, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is just try rephrasing the question or rephrasing what you said. Sometimes it is an issue with vocabulary. So just a simple rephrase can be super helpful. Um, and then another strategy that we use a lot is we call it the listen cue. So this helps just kind of like get a child with hearing losses auditory attention and remind them to listen because sometimes they do need to be reminded. There might be so many different sounds coming through they're not processing them well. It's feeling kind of jumbled in their brain. So we have to kind of get them back on track with listening. And so really it's just holding your hand up to your ear, making sure you have eye contact. And we just usually say, listen, or are you listening? Make sure to listen. 
And we, again, are giving them that visual cue with the hand on our ear or with older students, just like touching your ear or tapping your ear so that they're reminded, oh yeah, I need to actually pay attention to the sounds that I'm hearing. And this is the biggest one is just use their FM system. So most kids with hearing loss are going to have some kind of system. It's gonna be like a remote microphone. Um, we call them an FM system. You might hear remote microphone systems, but FM system is the widely used term. Um, and that is going to be a total game changer. So this ensures a favorable signal to noise ratio. Uh, that's referring to the intensity of the speaker's speech compared to the background noise. And that really needs to be our goal. We want our speech to be louder than the background noise going on around them. So there's gonna be plenty of situations where you cannot ensure that there's no background noise. It's just the reality of existing in the world. So an FM system, is gonna help kind of counteract the issues that we see background noise kind of give to our kids with hearing loss. So if your student has an FM system, make sure they're bringing it to whatever sessions they have with you, especially if you're testing the child, they need to have that FM system with them. And they should be learning how to be responsible for their own FM systems too. So they can, should be the ones that are remembering to charge it at the end of the day to remind their teacher or remind you to turn on your remote microphone so they can hear you. Um, again, it's going to provide additional access to sound in difficult listening situations because the microphone transmits your voice directly into the hearing aid or cochlear implant. So you bypass all of the, um, that interference from background noise. It makes overall understanding better by making sound audible and intelligible, which just makes it easier for them to listen. And the personal FM systems allow for the best speech recognition um, when compared to a classroom like sound field FM. So you might see a teacher who uses their microphone to like project the sound from speakers overhead. That's not the best for kids with hearing loss, but if that's all they have access to or all you have access to right now, that amplification is going to be better than nothing. So just use whatever you have. Okay, so we're going to jump into talking about assessment. Um, and I just want to start off by letting everyone know that conducting valid cognitive assessments is a topic that is really hotly debated among professionals in our field. Um, probably any teacher of the deaf that you talk to or SLP who specialize in this population is going to have a different opinion about what assessments are valid and reliable for this population. Some believe that none are and that any result you get is going to be invalid. And it's, again, just really, really debated. Um, also, just a disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist. So conducting like IQ tests is really outside like of my scope of practice. Um, I'm not an expert in that. So I'm just touching on what I know is used in the field. And then this is really a place where you'll need to use your best clinical judgment when making these decisions. And again, just ensuring that there's really good collaboration among team members. And that could go beyond just the child like teacher of the deaf. It might be helpful to get in touch with their audiologist to get those reports, get their kind of opinion on what's best for the child. And it's gonna be different from student to student as well. So there are less assessment instruments that are considered reliable and valid for this population. And then something else that's interesting is we do see lower IQ scores among kids who are deaf, hard of hearing when they're compared to same age hearing peers. And this is kind of where people get into that debate of, well, you can't use those scores reliably, or you can't like use those scores to make decisions because they're not normed on populations of kids with hearing loss and doesn't give you any good information, but um, that's not always the case. So again, it's just going to be very individual. I know that in our field, these are some IQ tests that are used pretty widely and pretty well accepted with the population of students who are hard of hearing. Um, and just thinking about the fact that the students who are using hearing aids and cochlear implants 
have shown that they access learning in an auditory oral environment. So they're typically making progress, they've developed speech, they're doing well. So we do feel that these students should be evaluated with tests that may not include the deaf, hard of hearing population, the norming group, because that's the information that's most relevant to them. We don't really care necessarily about how they're performing compared to deaf students who use ASL because they're not in the same educational environment. So if the child's being educated in their neighborhood school, they're in a hearing learning environment, those scores are relevant because we want to see how they're progressing and how they compare to their hearing peers. Um, so just again, something to keep in mind. Um, during assessment, you first thing would want to make sure that their technology is working properly. So older students should be able to tell you like if a battery is dead in their hearing aid. Um, if you look through their file and can get the information on like who manufactures their hearing aid or cochlear implant and what type they use, you can just go to the manufacturer's website and get like a little user guide that will tell you like what the lights on the hearing aid mean, what the lights on the cochlear implant mean. So then you can identify if they have a low battery, if they have a dead battery, if there's any kind of like connectivity issues. Um, and again, the child should be able to do this themselves. Um, you can also perform a Ling Six check. So this is just telling you say six different sounds. So it's mm, ah, e, u, s, and sh and see if the student can repeat those back to you. If they can, then you can be pretty confident that they're hearing all speech sounds. So each of those six sounds tests a different frequency of speech that includes all frequencies or all pitches of um, spoken language. So that's just a really quick and easy way for you to make sure that they are hearing everything that you say. You want to use optimal positioning, so that's sitting across from the child so that they have access to both visual and auditory cues. Making sure you have the child's auditory attention is really important. So again, you can use that listening cue. If that works for your student, you can um, just remind them, like make sure that you're listening. And if you're starting to get tired or your ears are getting tired, let me know and we can take a break. Um, again, be mindful of background noise. If all else fails, just speak at a close range. We consider three feet distance to be an optimal distance um, for ensuring acoustical access to your speech. So three, three feet kind of maximum. Um, six feet can be okay, but if you're in a testing session, I would definitely recommend keeping that distance to three feet or less. And then just provide plenty of wait time between your direction and the child's response. Um, one thing I did want to touch on really quick is listening fatigue. This is very, very real for kids who use hearing technology. It takes so much more energy and effort on their part to listen and process and understand what you're saying. They have to do like exert a lot more effort to like filter through all the sounds that come through and really like pay attention to your speech. So try to get testing done in the morning if you can. By the afternoon, our kids are usually pretty fatigued as far as listening goes. They um, might look, if they are experiencing listening fatigue, you might see them acting like more hyperactive, more distracted. They might seem really zoned out. They're struggling to focus. They might look kind of sleepy or be irritable, um, be showing like decreased sensitivity to auditory stimuli. So just kind of be aware of that. So if the child is really fatigued, like auditorily, you might want to consider like rescheduling your testing or rescheduling your session. Um, and then just making sure that you're using like good visuals and other um, kind of compensatory type behaviors that can help fill in the gaps if they are feeling fatigued and you can't reschedule. So when we're talking about hearing loss, I did want to make sure I touched on the impact that it has on social skills. So kids with hearing loss miss out on a lot of incidental social learning opportunities. We learn a lot about social interaction and appropriate behavior and like 
cultural norms when interacting with others, just kind of by overhearing what other people are saying and listening to other people's conversations. And they might not be getting this because remember, if people are speaking at a distance, they might have no access to that sound. So again, they're just missing out on those incidental opportunities the rest of us have. Typically, if they are struggling socially, they're going to need really explicit social skills instruction. And I know a lot of school psychs in the schools will see these students um, if they are doing like social skills groups with kids in their setting. Um, they need to learn compensatory skills, so how to make better use of their other senses, like vision, to kind of make up for their hearing loss. Um, I wanted to point out one I, uh, measure that we use a lot in deaf ed to kind of keep track of our kids' social skills development, and it's specifically designed for use with kids who are deaf, hard of hearing, and um, takes into account kind of specific, unique str uh, struggles or things you might see for kids with hearing loss. And it's called the Minnesota Social Skills Checklist for students who are deaf, hard of hearing. And you can access this online. It's free. Um, and you can just download that if you ever need it. So kids with hearing loss are more likely to feel lonely or unhappy at school. That's been reported a lot in the research. There's social problems are actually more apparent in kids with a mild or moderate loss, which some people find really surprising, but we kind of think that this is due to the fact that their hearing loss isn't as visible as students with a more severe loss or those that identify as being deaf. And so a lot of times those kids don't receive the necessary intervention, especially in the area of social skills. They look like they're doing fine, they might be doing fine academically, they're on grade level, so they don't get that more like unique and tailored instruction that they really need to overcome some of the social struggles that we see with the hearing loss. Um, remember, if these kids are delayed in their communication or in speech and language, that has a huge impact on their ability to interact socially. Um, they might not like get jokes that their friends tell. They might miss some of what's being said in conversation. So that has a really big impact that we usually see a lot more of when the child's older. Our kids with hearing loss, especially the mild and moderate loss, typically blend in pretty well, like in early childhood, kindergarten, first grade, those lower elementary years. And then as they get older and the social demands kind of increase, they're more nuanced, um, we start seeing some pretty big gaps in kind of just their overall social skill development when compared to their peers. And that's a huge issue because adolescents, like those middle school and high school years are so important as far as social relationships goes and being accepted into a peer group. So just keep that in mind too. Kids with hearing loss are overall less likely to participate in group activities. Um, they might be embarrassed about missing what's said or misunderstanding a question. They don't wanna answer in the wrong way, so they just avoid participating. And those group activities and activities with multiple people talking at once, interacting at once, are much more difficult listening situations. So sometimes we just see our kids avoid those. Um, something else to think about if you do work with older students is there's a huge stigma around like hearing aids and cochlear implants or anything that's deemed as like out of the norm to neurotypical hearing kids. So with middle school and high school age kids, we will lo a lot of times see huge resistance to even wearing their hearing technology. They'll put their hearing aids on in the morning when they're home. And then as soon as they get to school, they take them off and they go right in their backpack because they don't want to look different. And that's a huge issue because we know that without that technology, they're not accessing much at all. And so it's really important to have those discussions with these kids and with their peers and get them comfortable with talking about what it's like living with a hearing loss, advocating for their needs and not being embarrassed about being hard of hearing or needing to use hearing aids or cochlear implants. There's also been a lot of research done on theory of mind development in the deaf hard of hearing population. So we see just a lot of delays here with like perspective taking and all of that and then self-advocacy too. Um, I am so behind on time. So I 
did not even look at the clock. I'm going to jump really quick into blind and visual impairments. I think this one will be a little bit shorter just because this population is so, so, so heterogeneous. Um, there's a lot more variation in these students. If it's okay, Annie, do you think I can go until 2.50 and we can cut the question part down to 10 minutes? Yes, okay. you can. The question, the Q&A session could be as short or as long as you want it to be. Okay. So when we're talking about blindness and visual impairment, it's a spectrum. It's rarely absolute. Um, we usually think of visual impairments like in three different categories. So blind, completely blind, um, really limited functional vision. Functionally blind refers to students who have some usable vision and may be able to use that like as far as travel goes, getting around their environment, but rely more on auditory or tactile means to um, like access educational materials. So they might use a combination of like braille and large print, um, but can still see well enough like to travel. Um, it just kind of depends on the child. And then low vision, is what you'll probably see most of out in the schools and in gen ed settings. Those are students with a visual impairment um, who might wear glasses or might have a restricted visual field um, or blind spots, but use vision as their primary mode of learning and receiving information. Um, the impact of visual impairment is tied to the onset severity type of vision loss and then any additional disabilities that may be present too. So it's really important to know the etiology. So know if the child's vision loss is an ocular disorder, so something structural with the eye, or is it neurological, so something involving the brain. Neurological etiologies usually increase the likelihood of the child having additional disabilities like autism or a learning disability. Um, and then the etiologies that are ocular in nature are a lot less likely to have additional disabilities. Um, however, some ocular disorders are part of specific syndromes. Um, that might have additional central nervous system involvement. So just know what the child's vision loss is and whether or not it's ocular or neurological. So you can look into that further and kind of be more aware of things you should be looking for. When you're working with a child who's blind or visually impaired, again, we're most concerned about that access piece. So be really mindful of lighting. Usually our goal is to increase illumination. Better lighting typically leads to better viewing, um, but you also wanna be careful that you're reducing glare. Most ocular disorders or kids with a vision loss are gonna be really sensitive to glare. So that includes like windows and light sources. You don't wanna, have a child facing a window because that's going to produce a lot of glare. Even laminated materials can emit lots of glare. So just be mindful of that too. Um, you probably want to decrease the distance between the child and the visual target. And then again, knowing the direction of the light source and if that's going to produce any glare that'll be distracting or impact their ability to see. Um, you can also look at using high contrast materials. So like black on white, bolder print, better spacing with anything that you're printing off and wanting them to read is gonna be really helpful. Make sure you keep the location of furniture consistent in your room. Don't move things around. They've already oriented to the location of things in your room just for safety. Keep chairs pushed in, keep your cabinets closed. Doors out to the hallway should be either completely shut or all the way open to kind of help with that orientation piece. Really, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're communicating with the child's TVI, communicating with their O&M specialist to be aware of any like individual differences or preferences of the child when you're working with them. Um, as far as materials go, you can use color contrast to bring the student's attention to specific materials, objects, or landmarks. Be mindful of their preferred visual fields and field loss. A lot of kids will like have a total peripheral field loss or an upper field loss or a lower field loss. So that's gonna affect A, where you're positioning yourself and B, where you position materials that you want the child to be able to see. So just make sure you're communicating with the student, you're communicating with parents, you're communicating with other professionals so that you understand what those needs are. If they use any assistive technology like a magnifier or a telescope or a screen reader, get familiar with that. 
um, and get used to talking a lot more, get used to giving verbal descriptions of what you're doing or what others are doing, especially in the context of social interactions, um, because they're missing all of those little like visual subtleties that we use to kind of gauge what's going on, especially when we're interacting um, in a social setting. And this is just some basic etiquette. Um, introduce yourself by stating your name. When the student's with you, when you greet someone in passing, greet that person by name so the student knows who it is. Not everyone is good at identifying people by their voice. So just think about that. Even for kids with low vision, they might have enough vision to get around pretty well and seem like they're doing fine, but they might have a loss of like visual acuity and not be able to see like details of your face and maybe using like hair color to try to discriminate between people that are around them. So just try to use your names and the names of others as much as possible. Um, don't be afraid to use words like look. These are really common expressions. Even if the child has no vision, they still know what it means to look. They just look with their hands or by listening. So don't be afraid to use that terminology. They're not gonna be offended that you said look and they can't see. Um, try to limit your use of hand signals just because they might miss out on those and then giving verbal cues before initiating any kind of physical contact. Um, label objects or like different things with direction location words. Don't use phrases like it's over there, or right here, be specific. Say it's on the table to your right, it's to the left of the door, things like that so they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, don't jump out of the way when you see a blind student walking with their cane. If their cane bumps you and they have to walk around you, it's the exact same thing as if you're walking and use your vision to locate a person and move around them. It's actually more isolating and more embarrassing for them when people like jump out of the way of their cane. And um, it's really obvious to them, even if they can't see you. Okay, so assessment for these kids is a lot more complex than with deaf, hard of hearing, just because the population is so, so, so heterogeneous. There's so many different um, pieces of different visual impairments, different levels, different ways that it impacts them in their daily lives. So the accessibility of any test is going to depend on the type and degree of the student's vision loss. And this is where you need to be just like over communicative with their TBI which can be difficult. I know a lot of TVIs in the district have huge caseloads. Um, so try to plan accordingly, give them plenty of time to set aside time to talk to you and meet with you because there's not gonna be one assessment that works for every child with a visual impairment. So review their eye report, review their functional vision assessment. That's gonna be an assessment that's done by the TVI and is gonna outline exactly how much vision they have, how they use it, and how it impacts daily life. So really important information for you to know. And then the learning media assessment is something else you should familiarize yourself with that goes through what the best learning medium is for the child. So are they a large print user? Are they a braille user? Um, you need to have that information and just make sure you're collaborating. I won't read through the tests that are pretty accepted. Um, but we'll just talk really briefly on social skills. Kids with visual impairment miss out, again, on the majority of incidental social skill learning opportunities, even more so than kids who are hard of hearing. Um, it's estimated that about 80% of everything we learn in social situations is through vision. So if there is a vision loss, that has a huge, huge, huge impact in social skill development. A lot of people lower their expectations for these students in general. Um, which is something I didn't really touch on, but just make sure you don't do that. Have high expectations. These kids are so capable. Um, they can do amazing things. They just might need a little bit more support on the front end um, to effectively access their environment and social interactions with others. They don't have access to others' social cues. They don't see the body language. They don't see the subtle facial expression changes. They might not see gestures. So that really, really impacts how much they're going to understand socially about what's going on around them. So they need that explicit instruction piece. Again, even the kids who are visually impaired that are on grade level and they're academics, they don't have an additional learning disability. They probably need some support with social skills. 
when you're teaching social skills to them, think about things like nonverbal behaviors that we use to indicate interest to someone we're speaking to, um, respecting the personal space of others. They might be really used to getting close to see something, but they need to be aware of what someone else's reaction to that might be and how that's gonna impact them socially. How do you make contact with someone else you wanna to talk to according to our cultural norms? Um, do they know that they should be turning and facing the voice of the speaker even if they can't see them? That's considered polite in almost all settings. Um, are they aware of different facial expressions or changes in tone of voice? I can give them a better idea of kind of what the speaker's message is. They might struggle with sarcasm, might need help identifying that through tone of voice alone. Um, are they aware of what behaviors they might be exhibiting that could cause social isolation? Do they know that others are having nonverbal reactions to things that they're doing? I believe that even though this can be an uncomfortable topic to discuss with these kids, they, they have a right to know what other people's reactions are, even though they can't see them. So then they can make an informed decision on whether or not they wanna continue exhibiting that behavior around other people and around their peers. And then working on compensatory skills to access too. So I've also included some resources that you guys can go through. Um, I don't know if this will be able to like give you guys a copy of the presentation, but I can also just send out a separate email um, with these resources that can help you get more information specific to hearing loss and vision loss. And that's all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paige, for that wonderful presentation. Um, right now we're going to open up the last few minutes we have till the end of the hour for a question and answer session. So um, feel free to use the chat box or if you're feeling comfortable, you could just jump right in. Thanks, Paige. This was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me was earlier on in the presentation, you talked about sort of the diagnostic, like overshadowing that can occur and like really needing to hone into the differential diagnosis that happens. And I think that's such an important piece, uh, especially working with this population, because it's so easy to make errors. And then like you mentioned throughout the presentation, there's major implications. So I'm, I guess like do you think like the, what would be like the words of wisdom you'd give to like the school psychologist maybe who's, who ha is having to do this work so that they can like be intentional and slow down and, and make sure they're doing it right? I would say, first of all, just really take the time to get to know the child, research um, what their hearing loss is, what their vision loss is, what the etiology is. So you have more information just in general of some things to look out for, because again, there are some specific diagnoses or ocular disorders or like etiologies of hearing loss that are more cl closely tied to um, like specific diagnoses, especially autism. That's just a huge one that we see um, tied or linked really closely to specific diagnoses. So really getting to know the child and being aware of what those like overlaps and symptoms might be. And is there another way to test um, like kind of the like underlying cause of the topographical behavior, if that makes sense. So, I mean, a really obvious one that comes to mind first is on a lot of measures for testing for autism, we see, does a child make eye contact? If a child has low vision, if a child's blind, they're obviously not going to make eye contact. So is there another way that you can measure or look at like, okay, so the underlying kind of feature of lack of eye contact for autism is what, and how can I measure that in a child who's visually impaired or blind? Same thing with like pointing. A lot of kids with low vision don't use like a distal point because they don't see it. So that gesture is meaningless, but if they have some vision, and can see things immediately around them, are they using a proximal point to bring your attention to something or just being aware of how these populations demonstrate like joint attention and things like that, that aren't necessarily like gay, visual shift of gaze between you and an object of interest. So just keeping those things in mind. And again, I think a lot of it comes down to 
just as professionals really making the effort to understand and kind of become an expert in their vision loss or their hearing loss. So you have a better understanding of what that's all gonna look like. Thanks, I really appreciate that. And to really proceed with caution, right? Like you have to really yeah. take your time. Thank you. Absolutely. So if there aren't any other questions, we do have enough time to do the hearing loss simulation if you guys are interested. <laughs> I think it's really helpful. Okay, so if you have your phone, you can, I just want you to write down the words that you hear. So we're gonna go through a simulation of a moderate hearing loss and then a simulation of a mild hearing loss. So let me go, this is my training site that I use for my assistants when they come and work in our classroom. So the first one is a moderate high frequency hearing loss. Dance. This time we'll simulate a moderate high frequency hearing loss. Word number one. Mm. Number two. Mm. Number three, mm. Number four, mm. Okay, well, let's do the first four. Did everyone get their guesses written down? Okay, so now we'll do the same words with a mild hearing loss. Um, and remember when you're listening to these that a lot of kids who use hearing technology, their best correction is in the mild hearing loss range. A simulation of a mild high frequency hearing loss. Word number one, Bob. Number two, Pearl. Number three, Flower. Number four, No. Okay, so I'm going to give you the answers. So number one is Bath. Number two is Pearl. Number three is sour. And number four is mouse. So I think it's really, I think I love that simulation just because I think a lot of us, when we hear like mild hearing loss, moderate hearing loss, we're thinking of things sounding like quieter or just not being able to hear as well. But with speech sounds, depending on where the sound is actually formed in your mouth, that's what impacts what we call the frequency or the pitch of the sound. So most people have high frequency hearing loss and are missing sounds in those higher frequencies. And even if you have perfect amplification, they're using all their technologies, missing even one or two of those frequencies seriously impacts how well they can understand speech because it distorts that signal. So I thought that might be helpful to, for you guys to hear what that might sound like to someone with a hearing loss. Thank you so much, Paige. I think that was a great note to end off of. Um, you gave such an amazing presentation. I think this topic is really important, especially for a lot of future leaders in schools. Um, this presentation is recorded and will be um, published to the lab's website. So you can access that by going to www.u-tteclab.com. And if Paige would like, I could also post a um, copy of the presentation slides on the website as well. So if you have anybody you know who could not attend today's session, feel free to pass along that information. And with that, thank you again so much for joining and we will see you in the next one. Thank you.